Hey Hylians, happy Halloween. When it comes to dark games within the Zelda series, there are two that will come to mind, Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess. Majora's Mask is, and maybe always will be, the poster child for dark and creepy things in the Zelda series. Its tone, themes and visuals all work in perfect harmony to make your journey through Termina an interesting and unnerving one. But over the years I've realised when it comes to people describing Twilight Princess as dark, it mainly comes down to a few things. Its visual style as it's much more realistic and muted compared to the games before it, the Twilight Realm is literally a land of darkness, and throughout the game there are a few creepy moments, for example Yetta's transformation into Blizzetta, and of course the infamous cutscene where the light spirit Lanayru tells you of the power of the few shadows. And while all these things are valid for the game being considered dark, I feel there are some things within Twilight Princess that are simply not talked about that are far more creepy. Elements of the game that seem to be glossed over, despite being some of the main parts of the game and its story. And so today, let me show you the true twisted darkness found throughout all of Twilight Princess. We'll start with a creature you'll be seeing from the very early parts of the game up until the end of it. The Twilight Beasts are monsters that make up the Usurper King Zant's army. They are fast and powerful, but these monsters are not like others, not like ones in Hyrule, and not even like the ones found within the Twilight Realm. Their appearance is unsettling, with their long lanky arms and large masked faces. The way they almost gallop towards you because their arms are so long they use them as another set of legs is just uncomfortable. And then there's their screams. These monsters come in groups, and if you leave one alive, they will scream and revive the others. All must be destroyed at the exact same time, or you'll be stuck fighting them until you can no more. But still, what makes them so different from other monsters in both Hyrule and the Twilight Realm? Sure, they're disturbing, but that's not new to the series. And not even new to the game, there's definitely some other enemies in the game that are pretty creepy. Well, you see, this armoury of monsters wasn't always like this. Every Twilight Beast that you fight was once a normal Twilight a normal, peaceful citizen of the Twilight Realm, now corrupted and transformed by Zant's dark power. The Twilight Beasts are transformed against their will, to become these twisted monsters, and forced to fight against Link. What makes this worse is Midna. Midna is the Twilight Princess, and she already knows, from first-hand experience, what Zant's power can do and she knows that these people are her own, transformed against their will, and through the game she must realise what Link is doing, that he is killing her people, but she doesn't stop him, because there's nothing she can do for them anymore. But that's not where this disturbing story of the Twilight Beast stops. When you make your way to Kakariko Village, covered in Twilight, you find three of these beasts. You fight and make your way to the Sanctuary, where you find the Children of Orden and the residents of Kakariko Village. Or, what remains of the residents. If you listen to Barnes, the owner of the bomb shop, you can hear him talk about a woman from the village who was attacked by one of the Twilight Beasts. They went to go get help to save her, but when they came back, there was now two beasts. It's pretty easy to overlook this piece of information, but it implies that the woman was attacked and transformed into a Twilight Beast, showing that being made into a monster for Zant is not just limited to the Twilight, and that even Hylians could easily be transformed into monsters. It was a very long time ago, but the Twilight's ancestors were originally from Hyrule, so it's very likely that they were very similar to Hylians. So unknowingly, Link could be in the same boat as Midna, killing his own kind now transformed into these monsters. 
Though this is still not the only instance of the dark magic of the twilight corrupting those around it. Within Twilight Princess, we have two main goals throughout the game. The first is to seek out the three remaining parts of the few shadows hidden around Hyrule, and the second is to find the scattered pieces of the Mirror of Twilight that have also been hidden around the kingdom. We are told many times that the few shadows are a dangerous and powerful magical item. Long ago, it was used by the ancestors of the Twilight People, the Dark Interlopers, to try and take control of the Sacred Realm, and with it, the Triforce. It is because of this that those people were thrown into the Twilight Realm and locked away, banished from Hyrule. And while not mentioned as much, the Mirror of Twilight is just as bad. It was never used in the same way as the Few Shadows. It was a link between worlds a gate between Hyrule and the Twilight Realm, but it still somehow had dark power connected to it. Both of these items are very powerful, and it's clearly shown off once with each piece. With the few shadows, we see how it corrupted and transformed the leader of the Gorons, Darbus, into a towering monster of flames, Thyrus. And with the Mirror of Twilight, we see the kind Yeti Yetta made to slowly fall ill from its presence, and eventually transform before our very own eyes into the frozen monster Blizzetta. So there is no denying that both of these items are able to corrupt those around them with some kind of dark magic. So then it shouldn't surprise you when you realize that every boss in the game, apart from Stalord, Zant and Ganondorf, are affected and corrupted by the magic in some way. Yes, every boss. After all, it is after defeating each boss that we receive a piece of the few shadow or mirror of twilight. It was something that for the longest time just seemed kind of normal. You get the item after defeating the boss. And so, even with being told about the power that these items hold, it never really clicked. But when it did, it made so much sense. So, what were these bosses? Well, it might not actually be too hard to see. The first boss of the game, Diababa, is found within the forest temple. It's a free-headed giant plant that lives right at the bottom of the temple. It isn't hard to see what this monster once was. Diababa seems to be three Dekubabas mutated together into one giant monster. It could also be the combination of two Deku Babas and one Big Baba, as the shape of the middle reflects that much closer. All of these monsters are found throughout the Forest Temple, and it seems that at some point a handful were exposed to the few shadow and slowly corrupted by its magic. It's very possible one may have even eaten a part of the few shadow, due to the Deku Baba's tendency to lunge at things nearby to attack. The second boss we've already talked about, Phyrus of the Goron Mines. We know Phyrus is the leader of the Gorons, Darvis, who has been corrupted and transformed by the few shadows' dark magic. After defeating Phyrus, we actually see Darvis left behind. After strange activities started happening within Death Mountain, Darbus left to check on the Goron Mines, and while he was at it, he checked on the few shadow hidden within the mines. After coming into contact with the few shadows, he transformed into Phyrus. Once transforming, it's said that he was extremely aggressive and caused destruction to the Goron Mines. And so the Goron Elders ordered for him to be chained up and for the room that he was in to be locked shut, as there was now nothing that they could do to help him. After defeating Phyrus, we see Darbus back to his normal self, though he is confused and seems to have zero recollection of what just happened. The third boss is Morpheal, found in the depths of the Water Temple. And this is where you might need to put your thinking caps on. Unlike before, where we have directly seen who transformed into the boss, or have enemies in the temple that can explain what transformed, in the Water Temple, there is nothing like Morpheal to be found. Well, 
not in this version of the Water Temple. I believe that Morphiel is the corrupted Morpher from Ocarina of Time. Now it may sound crazy at first, but I don't think it's too outlandish. It was said Ganon created Morpher, but I can see him simply having control over it to some extent, or manipulating it to do what he needed it to do. And it was always something that existed before him, hiding deep within the temple. First off, the names. Morpha and Morphiel. They're extremely similar to one another. And looking at the other two bosses that we've talked about already, and even the bosses that we'll talk about soon, we can see that all of them have parts of the names of what they originally were in the boss monster's names. Diababa with Baba from Deku Baba, and Phyrus being a combination of Fire and Darbus. With this logic, Morphiel would be the combination of Morpha and Eel, which I feel perfectly fits its appearance. Morpha is the boss of the Water Temple in Ocarina of Time. We can assume that the Water Temple in Twilight Princess is the same temple, only looking different because of the game. Twilight Princess is set in the Child Timeline, meaning in this timeline Link never entered the Water Temple, so Morpha could have easily been left alone in there for a very long time. And the big one, the appearance. When we first see Morpheal, its intro is done in a very similar way to Morpha's in Ocarina of Time. This is clearly no accident. We then get more tentacles appear, but it's still only the eyeball that is the weak spot. Again, like Morpha. And even when the full body of Morpheal is revealed, it's still only the eye that can be damaged. And yes, because I feel someone will call me out on this, I know Morpha isn't actually an eye, it's a nucleus but it resembles an eye so much, and the body of it looks so much like a tentacle, that I could see the magic of the few shadows transforming them to fit more with what Morpheal would become. It may also be what happened with Armagoma, who we will see later. Again, it's clearly no accident that these two bosses are so alike. From the creature itself, its name, and to the temple it's found in. And while you can say it's all just a reference to Ocarina of Time, with all of the other bosses seemingly being corrupted by Twilight Magic in some way, I think this is the only explanation for what Morpheal really was. Moving on to Dungeon 4, we have the only boss apart from Xant and Ganondorf that isn't actually corrupted by the Few Shadow or Mirror of Twilight, Stalord though it is still affected by Twilight Magic. Stowlord is a giant monster found in Arbiter's Grounds, though when we get to it, it's already dead, and has been for a long time as only the bones remain. It's only once Xant appears and uses his magic to bring it back to life that it's any threat. It's an easy one to explain, it's just Xant's magic. But with this, we again can see what he can do with his magic. Transforming innocent people isn't all he can do. Resurrecting the dead is also another trick. And maybe this magic is also why the Twilight Beasts can resurrect their comrades once they're killed. The fifth dungeon of the game, Snow Peak Ruins, is where we find Yetta, who transforms into Blizzetta before our very eyes. When we first get to Snow Peak and meet with the Yeti Yetto, he tells us he wanted to get the reek fish so he could use it in some soup for his wife who had recently become sick. We find out that Yeto found part of the Mirror of Twilight, and like the loving husband he is, he gave it to his wife as a gift. But slowly after receiving the gift, she started to become very ill. Throughout the dungeon, we talk to Yeta. She marks locations on our map to try and help us, though she always sends us to the wrong place suggesting the mirror sickness could be messing with her head. We can also tell it's weakening her, as she spends most of the time sitting in one room of the mansion by a fire, only getting up to show us to the mirror in her bedroom. It is here in the bedroom where things go from bad to worse for Yetta. Looking once more into the mirror, something happens. Yetta starts repeating words and begins twitching, before turning to face us, and this happens. (laughs) 
In just a matter of moments, this peaceful woman had transformed into a twilight ice monster, Blizzetta. This transformation shows that while the Mirror of Twilight may not be seen as as dangerous as the few shadows, it certainly is. We're able to save Yetta by defeating the monster she became, and luckily she's alright, though also seems a little confused, just like Darbus was. The sixth dungeon of the game is the Temple of Time, home to Armagoma. Much like the Forest Temple, what would become Armagoma is hinted at all over the Temple of Time. Throughout the temple, we can find many baby Goma and also young Goma. It could be that one of these came into contact with the mirror and transformed, though it's also possible that Armagoma is the mother to these young and baby Goma, a queen Goma, that came into contact with the mirror and transformed shortly after. That could explain why there are so many baby and young Goma within the temple, yet we see no fully grown mother to them. Within the boss battle against her, we see her lay eggs that turn into baby Goma, so we know that Arma Goma was the one laying the eggs around the temple. The only thing that could go against this is after defeating the first form of Arma Goma, we see its true form is another spider that is much smaller and only slightly bigger than the baby Goma. This could just be another effect of the mirror, now that the main transformation, the armor, has been destroyed. Or this is just how the Queen Goma looked, though I doubt that one. It's still possible that a baby or young Goma came into contact with the mirror and transformed, as there are so many in the temple. Though with no mother or Queen Goma to be found, I like the idea of Arma Goma being the corrupted queen. A final idea is that there are also a lot of Beemos found all over the Temple of Time, and one of Armagoma's main attacks is shooting a beam of light out of her eye. When destroying a Beemos with a controlled statue, you can also find baby Goma within them sometimes. Maybe Armagoma is the corrupt combination of both of them, the shape, being a giant spider, coming from the baby Goma and the laser eye and armor coming from the stone Beemos. And now we are at the final dungeon of the game with a corrupted boss, Dungeon 7, the city in the sky, where we can find the dragon Argorok. For a long time, I was under the belief that Argorok was just a normal dragon that had appeared one day and attacked the city. But looking at everything else that we've talked about so far, there is an explanation for this monster. Kargoroks. The giant flying birds that can be found all over Hyrule and the city in the sky. Now yes, we do have shadow Kargoroks in the twilight, but this Kargorok would be native to Hyrule and would be affected by the Mirror of Twilight, so I don't think it would end up looking the same as a normal shadow Kargorok. Again, let's look at the name of the boss. Argorok. It seems like a combination of Agro and Kargorok. Like all of the other bosses, the name of the boss shows what it once was, and in this case it tells us that Agarok was a Kargorok, corrupted by the Mirror of Twilight and transformed into this giant dragon. When talking to Midna in the City in the Sky at some point, she will say, hey, it's that overgrown bird again. This could just be a throwaway line as a kind of insult to the dragon, or it's straight up telling us that this is what it once was. An overgrown bird. A giant Kargorok turned into a giant dragon. Like I said before, Kargoroks are found in Hyrule, but are also found in the city in the sky, so it's possible one could come across the mirror shard that was sent there. There are also a lot of similarities between both Argorok and Kargoroks, beside the name. Kargoroks have a long tail that could easily become Argorok's long tail with a grapple on the end of it. The heads of both are very similar shapes to one another, and both have the same amount of claws on their feet. We've also seen with Armagoma before that armor can be a part of the monster's transformation, so this would explain the black armor covering Argorok's body. The dark magic that Xant and the few shadows hold is said to be the same power that was once used by the dark interlopers. 
And if what we've seen in Twilight Princess is what could be done with such power, then I can totally understand why the goddesses ordered the light spirits to seal them away in the twilight. We know that over time, the twilight did come to abandon this magic, and the few shadows remained held by the royal family of the land to keep it safe. Midna only uses its power in the game as a last ditch effort to stop Zant, and when we see her use it, even when using just a small amount of its power against Zant, it completely destroys him, blowing up his body from the inside out. And when she uses all of its power, she transforms into a monster, only just able to control herself. Ganondorf said that he gave some of his power to Zant, but that power, I feel, was more of a key to unlock the dark magic that had been locked away within the hearts of the Twilight for generations. Even Ganondorf's magic at this point was never so corrupting. We are told time and time again within the story of Twilight Princess just how dangerous the magic we seek really is. But I don't think all too many of us really realised that the dark magic is truly affecting and poisoning the land of Hyrule and the creatures and people within it. The twilight that blankets the land may have its own effects, but it's the ancient magic that was the true terror of the land. While many are monsters that were affected, they are still a part of Hyrule, unknowingly coming into contact with something that will ultimately destroy them. It's lucky that Yetta and Darbus were able to be saved, but after, we still see the effects of the dark magic messing with their mind. And we can't forget the poor innocent Twilight and even Hylians that were forcibly transformed by the dark power into Twilight Beasts and forced to attack the land of Hyrule and the people within it. The dark magic of the Twilight is truly a disturbing thing when you really look at all it did within Twilight Princess. And this is why I feel Twilight Princess can be just as creepy as Majora's Mask. For the longest time, it never really hit me that this is what was going on throughout the game. But once I realised, it all made perfect sense. I knew the things we were hunting were full of evil dark power, but we get to see what just a single part of that dark power could do, with what it does to the creatures that are transformed into the bosses throughout the game. And I think this was such a perfect, subtle way to show off the true, twisted dark power. When I finally realised what was going on, that all of these bosses were once normal creatures, it was then that it really hit me how dangerous this twilight power really is and why we were warned so many times. Hey Hylians, thank you for watching all the way to the end of today's video. It's a topic that I've wanted to cover for quite a while now and I thought with it being spooky month, it would be the perfect time to do so. Like I mentioned at the start of this video, I feel when people call Twilight Princess a dark game, most of the time it comes down mainly to the style and a couple of moments throughout it. But after hearing what I had to say today, did your mind change on why it's so creepy? I think in a way I was kind of conditioned by other Zelda games into not really paying much attention. When you play a Zelda game, you go through the dungeon, defeat the boss, and get the item from the boss that you've been searching for, whether that be a sacred stone, or a Triforce chart, or whatever the hell you're looking for. So when you get a piece of the Mirror of Twilight or Fused Shadow from the boss, it just kind of seems normal. And this is why, for so long, I never really put the pieces together that these bosses were corrupted. And when I realised that, and I looked at the names of the bosses, characters we see transform into bosses, and enemies within dungeons that look very similar to the bosses, then it kind of just became so clear and easy for me to really see what was going on in this game. And I really love it. It's kind of subtle. It doesn't outright say, hey, this boss was this creature. It's been corrupted and transformed by this few shadow. You really have to put the pieces together yourself and I really love that. It's never really stated. 
but it gives an explanation to every single boss in the game, apart from Ganon, Zant, and Stalord. If you have anything to say about today's video, do leave a comment below. I always love reading them and do try my best to reply to every single one. If you like the video, don't forget to give it a like. It's the best and fastest way to show me that you are enjoying the content I create. And if you're new around my channel, welcome! Don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell so you never miss an upload from me. I post almost exclusively Legend of Zelda content, and so if you're a big Zelda fan like myself, I'm sure you'll enjoy what I create. Thank you all again for watching all the way to the end of today's video. I know it's been a long one, so it really does mean a lot. I hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye!